Let's take a look at the Druid here. Uh, the Druid looks a little bit different uh, because the people were not very satisfied with the Druid, right? So you can see that uh, we got some big dips here. Wild Shape is obviously down at the bottom. Um, but the Druid, uh, between these two surveys, never actually jumps up like the Rogue did, right? Uh, and this is a case where, again, the Druid class is seeing some overall satisfaction issues. Um, there, everything kind of still follows the same path here, though. So uh, you can see that we improved some things a little bit, but... Yeah. There's one huge difference. I don't know if you can see it. So we said, hey, Thieves Cant, pure ribbon, right? People hate it, that's fine. Hey, Druid, wild shape. Uh, everyone hates that. That's probably not good for your class's signature mechanic. Yeah. So. Yeah, so what, what happened here, though, was that we did not revise wild shape between these two surveys, right? So. It, it actually looks like it got a little worse in October. It did. <laughs> it did, actually. Because it did not get revised, I think people were like, I rated it a two before, but I'm going to rate it a one this time yeah. because that's that's going to make them change it, right? So, um, speaking of wild shape specifically, so uh, we obviously have now identified wild shape as something that's a problem at this point. So, what are we going to do to solve it? Well, uh, we start looking in the comments. Uh, the October playtest uh, comment analysis was an 88-page document. So we then have 88 pages worth of comments. And I don't mean like oh each co each comment is on a single page. You know, like each page is like 30 comments, right? Um, we then have to go through this entire document and look for instances of wild shape, and then also just sort of evaluate the comments as a whole. Uh, once we did that, we were able to pull out some specific issues from the comments. So again, we've identified the problem through data. Now I can look for specific issues uh, inside the comments, and uh, these are the things that people were saying basically about the, uh, about the wild shape feature. And so what we ended up doing was making revisions based on this, uh, these comments. And so that would guide our next iteration of, uh, of Wild Shape. And it's, is there any more on, on Wild Shape? No. The next? Okay. So I want to add a little postscript to this. We're now seeing, as people are playing the game, the published version, that maybe Wild Shape's a little too good. <laughs> so, and this is actually, yeah. it, it's what's going to happen, because you, you do hit a point where you're running out of... of, uh, of uh, runway. Yeah, of, of uh, runway. Because it was something that was always kind of a problem. And we did in the end, our final round of, of feedback was good, yeah. but now it's kind of a question of we kind of already knew going into the release that if you were to say, hey, what is a mechanic you think might be a problem? Well, we already kind of knew, like, maybe this is where something could go wrong because it was fairly volatile. It was fairly had ratings issues going in. We had to do a lot of reconcepting of it. And one of the things we're going to be doing for the future going forward with the game is to continue doing these surveys so we can get a sense as the game evolves, as the play environment evolves, are the mechanics that, that drift over time. Like an obvious one might be, hey, we do the first survey, people hate, I'll just make something up. People hate the bard. Okay, the bard's underpowered. What do we want to do to address that? But we might find that, hey, the druid, I'll just another example I'm making up, the druid started out really highly rated in say 2015, but in 2016 it had gone down. Well, what's going on there? Are there things that as people become more, like greater experts in the game, they're now discovering problems that they didn't have before. Uh, if you played uh, when 3.0 first came out. You're gonna talk uh, about the monk? Well, I was going to talk about the, the spike chain. Okay, sure, yeah. So the, the spike chain's a good example. When I first started playing 3.0, no one used the spike chain because it was this weird weapon in the back and no one, you know, yeah, use a sword or an axe. It's used, right? And then I had the experience in my gaming group and a lot of other gaming groups, I think, had the same experience of when you're making your second set of characters, someone goes, hey, spike chain, this is kind of interesting. And improved trip and, uh, okay, I'm going to try making this character. And then suddenly now, hey, wait a sec, the spike chain, which wouldn't have been a problem, on our first campaign is now like, this is kind of a pain in the ass, you know, things like that. Or I vividly remember when I first started playing 3.0, my second gaming group, no, my third gaming group, because I had moved, uh, they all played Magic. So to them, optimizing was natural. So the first time I sat down to play with them, I remember my friend Bobby uh, handing me a sheet of all the buffs that his cleric was putting on me. And I had never experienced that playing d &D before. We just know you cast Fireball and Cure Wounds. And he was like, okay, I'm buffing all your stats and here's all this stuff. And it was very interesting to see this is something that evolved over time in the culture of the game. As people uncover these ways of playing and those ways spread, D&D is a culture, it's a living thing. The people playing it are, have a culture where people will talk on forums. And we're hoping to see, hey, we can see yeah. how things change over time. And then we can be a little more forward thinking in, well, what are the problems we want to address? And then more importantly, how do we actually address them? You know, where ideally we're doing things that are more subtle rather than just like the, the brute force, you know, let's just re revise the character class. Doing things a little bit more on the edges of it, but that still might fix things. Yeah. 
So uh, from April to June of this year, we did what we call the alpha triage. Uh, basically, we were able to uh, benefit from having a closed playtest list as well. We had, uh, it started out as a bunch of friends and family, then we slowly opened it up to more and more people. But by the end, we had, uh, I think it was about 200 different groups participating in our alpha playtests. These were people who had signed non-disclosure agreements and were getting material that was not being released to the public. Uh, this was basically for rapid playtesting. Uh, and so, uh, during the April to June period, we were able to take our uh, alpha playtesters and give them things that we've been working on since the close of the open playtest. Uh, so this was a smaller group of investor players, like I said. Uh, and just to give you an idea, uh, basically uh, the alpha triage process took place over these several months. And whenever we would get survey data in, or uh, sorry, uh, play alpha playtest feedback in, that every individual piece of feedback would be entered in effectively a bug log, right? Uh, and so for the tabletop role-playing game, we had, uh, and I think this is in just the June alpha triage feedback. Uh, no, sorry, I think it is just the May alpha triage feedback. We had uh, uh, almost 2,000 individual entries that we had to go through uh, to determine uh, what was an actionable item, right? Uh, so of those, 200 of those were duplicates, right? Two, two people had said the same thing. Uh, 800, or almost 900, I should say, were things that were uh, no action. Now, no action could mean either we disagree that it's a problem, right? Like when we looked at it and said, okay, this is not actually an issue, or more often what would happen is, okay, this person is looking at an incomplete rule, right? Because we would get something that's like, um, the sorcerer, or sorry, bad example. Uh, the Warlock uh, references the Conjure Elemental spell, and the Conjure Elemental spell is not in the playtest packet. Well, that would get entered as a bug. It's no action because we, we have that spell. It's just not, it just wasn't in that particular packet. And then we had 770, or 722 items that resulted in actual change. And these were all individual changes that were made to the player's handbook. This is only player's handbook material. This does not cover Monster Manual or Dungeon Master's Guide as well. Uh, and so basically you can see that we were taking, even you know, at the late stages of the process, taking the feedback we were getting in and making uh, you know, 700 changes in a, a month span. And that's, uh, it was a pretty daunting task for mostly me, Pete, and Jeremy to uh, undertake during that time. Uh, so we've talked a lot about the, what's worked in the playtest process, and it was largely a success, but there were a few things that if we could go back in time, we'd probably do differently. Uh, the first one was, uh, too many changes all at once. We were not doing small releases and, and uh, putting out like, oh, here's a new class, here's another class, here's the revised Rogue. We were doing big packets that would drop that would have a number of changes, not only to the core system, but also to the classes. And sometimes that was necessary, because like, okay, we're gonna change how this type of action works, and so we'd have to change that across all the classes. But a lot of times it was just a result of, we chose to aim for larger playtest packets, and so we were basically making a bunch of changes all at once, and it kind of made it hard to evaluate whether or not individual changes were actually successful, right? I mean, uh, this is something we figured out late, and it changed the way we did our alpha playtesting. But for the most part, um, these big packets, while uh, we you know, it didn't completely junk the data we were getting from it, it, we would have run into cases where, okay, we made this change in this class over here, it's actually causing bad feedback in this class over here. That actually happened with the rogue and the fighter, specifically. Uh, some changes we made to the fighter class ended up dinging the rogue class, right? And so there was a lot of confusion over what's actually causing the issues in the game. Uh, and then, of course, we ran into the issue of we drop a new packet. The people that are going to be playing this are not people that have been working on this game for the last three months like we have. It's actually people who have to read that and relearn it. So our playtesters have to go through this process. Okay, we now have to relearn everything we thought we knew about this game as opposed to the one player at the table needing to relearn how his class works or the DM needing to relearn how her monsters work or something like that, right? Uh, this was just a case where we made it harder on our playtesters than we absolutely had to. And I already talked about making it difficult to pinpoint problems. So moving on, unless you have anything you want to add. Last uh, slides, and we're going to talk more in depth of this next week. We'll be, I'll be back here with Jeremy Crawford to talk about it. But one of the big things we wanted to do was have an art style that uh, embraced diversity and had a got away from the sort of chainmail bikini sexualization of women that had been part of the past in fantasy, and especially D&D. &D. 
And one of the big things we did by doing that was applying some of the lessons we had learned from earlier projects. So in the past, what would happen is if you, I, I have actually have done this, I've experienced this as a person working on a product. We would say, okay, here is a character we want art for, and here is their ethnicity. You know, we want someone who is black or Asian or something like that. And we would get white people back, almost always. Because for a lot of times, if you're working with artists, it's very easy for them to not necessarily read through the entire art description, or they're in a rush, they're doing a lot of things. It was very easy for them to kind of default to what they knew. And there's kind of a sense, I think, in, 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 in not just in gaming, but in any industry, if you do what people have done before you, no one's gonna get upset, because that's what everyone's doing. And what we, wanted, what we had to do was change the conversation we're having with our artists. And a lot of that tied into going into the Forgotten Realms, our default world, and really bringing out the different ethnicities and cultures to the point where instead of seeing you know, uh, an Asian character in armor, they would see a, a Mulan barbarian. And you'd be like, well, what does that mean? I don't know what that word means. Like, I can't actually draw this because I don't know what it means. I have to go to the art Bible we had put together, which would show a sort of like you know, an, an, an Asian style culture or an African inspired culture and things like that, where the artist couldn't help but do the right thing for us in terms of diversity. Because we had done all the hard work for them. We showed them exactly what these cultures look like, what the people who are part of those cultures look like, their armor, their weapons, their dress. All they had to do was copy what was in the style guide, and we got what we wanted. And so a lot of that was pulling things out of the sort of real world. You know, this kind of language is just sort of easy to just glaze over and not pay attention to, and really call attention to it. And then very consciously in our art, as we commissioned art, tracking what were we commissioning? Were we hitting all the notes we had? And then also, I mean, I think part of it, I mean, this may sound a little mercenary, but we, we really tried to make all those cultures very visually interesting. So artists wanted to draw them. You know, when people got, like, you know, Rashemi art, you know, characters, something like that, they were happy because it meant they could do something that was really different, and they could do it knowing that we were supporting them, that our art Bible supported that. We weren't asking them, hey, it's, in some ways, the old way would have been, hey, artist, uh, we're going to put diversity on your lap, and we hope you get it right because if you get it wrong, we're not going to work with you again. You know, and that's a lot to put on someone who isn't working directly with you in an office. Our, our artists are freelance. We have one artist in-house. Uh, and it's asking them to make a lot of decisions that really the people running the project should be making and should be watching over. So it gave artists this real sense of comfort to go ahead and do this stuff, to really follow up on it. And we did a lot of that heavy lifting for them so they could just focus on giving us great art. And that was something that really worked out well for us, that we really just kind of rewrote the assumptions and a lot of it was just doing things like, rather than dealing in stereotypes, focus on personality. We do have some cheesecake art in the game. The succubus, the incubus, these are supposed to be seductive, supernatural beings. So we wanted cheesecakey kind of art because that made sense for that character. So rather than just giving in these kind of vague words or bland generalizations, really focusing on those personalities. So if someone was supposed to be sexy, it's because they were supposed to be, because that was this character, that's what he or she or the monster or whatever, that's what they represented in the game world. You know, that this is what this, how this character would dress or act. And so really kind of pulling away, really owning the, the, the task by taking real control of it and rebuilding the assumptions people were bringing to the table, we were able to really make progress. Now it's not perfect, we have their things, and next week we'll talk about stuff that worked and stuff that didn't. But this is just something by just sitting down and really consciously thinking about it and saying, hey, we're responsible for what ends up in the book. We're responsible for the message it sends and the message we want to get out there. Because one of the things I think we learned and we kind of talked through this is we would all, okay, we're all kind of think of ourselves as progressive people, but people don't know us, they know the work we do. So if we want that to come through, we have to, just like in the game and choosing like the three pillars and doing these surveys and play testing and figuring out what to fix, we had to really own this and actively work to make it happen. Because the default is that it doesn't happen and you know, honestly, in a lot of cases, it's just people just, they don't want to do things that are going to end up with them losing their job. You know, it's, it's about us having leadership and saying, no, we support this, we want you to do it, we're going to help you, and we're going to make it something that you're looking forward to, that you want to be part of. Because we're going to give you art that's going to be, we're going to give you characters and cultures that are fun to draw and fun to bring to life. So that was something that I think overall worked. I mean, there are things we've learned, and we can, we'll talk about it a little bit next week. Uh, but I think for us, just putting that effort into it went, went a long way and really, really helped in the overall art process.